afternoon. Thank you for having me. Thank you very much, sir, for your introduction. Um, I just came back from England last night, so I'm a little bit jet lagged, um, but very happy to be here. And uh, yeah, I've been giving many of these speeches since my work um, started to get a lot of media attention about five years ago. And with that media attention, there comes this sort of feeling of responsibility to to share something authentic. We have to, you know, recapture that which is essential. You know, if you put us on a desert island, you know, and we have to just really look at our basic, basic needs. They are food and water. That's, and of course, clothing, housing, that's secondary, but food and water is our primary needs. Now, this conference is about the climate change, if I, if I understand correctly. And, um, you know, it's a very important and pressing uh, subject in the world today because I mean, I've been talking about that in my in my uh, in my work since the uh, last 15 years, um, and it seems to be that it's really really hitting us now. You know, I mean, it's been hitting us already, but people have been sleeping, still sleeping, still not willing to to accept that the, you know that the world is one organism. As James Lovelock had pointed out, he created that Gaia hypothesis. So there's one world, and it's like a it's like a spider's web. You touch one thread, it will be affected here. You touch here, it will be affected here. So we are with the vast industrialization that we uh, that we uh, value so much on this planet because we're all running after I said, labum. <laughs> we want money, but at the end of the day, when there's no water left, when the earth is polluted, when the ice caps have melted, where there's flooding in England now, can you imagine England? There is drought. You know, there's drought where they're saying that even if there's severe rain this season, it will not replenish the, the, the you know, the water table. As, as, a, as a kid, I woke up, you know, I grew up going, walking to school, rain, 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 always raining. Now there's drought. You can't, you can't ignore that. So, you know, what's the, what's the solution to this? Is it funding? Is it governments? meeting up in their private jets in Switzerland and discussing climate change and all that? Is it some, what, what is the essential thing? You know, if it's down to you and me as individuals, surely we have to look at what is the most, you know, essential need, which is water and food. And if we look at industrialized agriculture, that is probably one of the main contributing factors to climate change. Especially just coming back from England, everything packaged, every single thing in a plastic bag, everything, you know, coming. People have no idea where the food comes from. On the plate is pasta, where it came from, no idea. Where did the wheat come from to make the pasta? No idea. It's the same in, in India as well. We don't know where the wheat comes from. We have rice idli for breakfast. And the nele ingi the where it's grown, we have no idea. Where is the woolen do grown? We don't know. Actually, if you go in the market and you ask to that Karigara and the Bazaar and Pondi, you ask him, where did this woolen do grow? He'll tell you Burma. If you fancy to have popcorn, you go and ask that Karigara in the Bazaar, where did the, the corn and Makachalam grow? He'll say Argentina. <laughs> that much far. Now imagine that we're in charge of bringing, we got the business to sell the makachalam, the corn, to make the popcorn. So what's the first thing? We need an airplane to bring it from Argentina. Now imagine we build an airplane. You know, there's a factories for the metal, factories for the plastic, for the electronics, you know, for the rubber, for the tires, for the paint, for all of that. And then the infrastructure and the petrol, the diesel, all of that, uh, oil tankers, refineries. We're talking of hundreds of kilometers of factories to build an airplane. And then we sit here and have our popcorn and we'll discuss climate change or yoga or whatever it is that we want to talk about. But that act of eating food that does not grow locally, that's our main contributing factor. Let's forget popcorn, it's a bit of a side thing. Let's talk about something basic. Everyone has potatoes. Potatoes don't grow in Tamil Nadu. You ask any of you are Tamilians, you go and ask your Kalapati, your Aya, you know. Aya, when you were a small girl, did you eat potatoes? They say, no, we say, why? Well, didn't grow here, not the right climate. But everyone's having potato in the karakorumbu, in the idli puri masala, in some dish or another, or they'll have lays or finger chips or whatever, no? Everyone's having potatoes. Again, you have to build a lorry. Factories for this, factories for the tires, for the paint, for the metal, for the petroleum. 
all of that, we don't consider what that is. We say very quickly, or oh, climate change, or we say carbon footprint, you know, but that's called ecological cost. That is the damage caused to this environment, the pollution incurred to this environment by eating foods that don't grow locally. You know, that's a very practical thing. So if we are concerned of climate change, it's us first, let's stop eating foods that don't grow locally. So what does that mean? That means to go back into a culture. So we look at the Tamil culture, the language is 40,000 years old. We have the incredible things like the Bharatanatyam or the Carnatic music and the, you know, the temples that are so many thousands of years old and, and you know, people don't know how to build those things, those, those uh, you know, structures anymore. You have esoteric texts like the Nadi Jadagam and all this spirituality. This the culture is like a banyan tree. It's extraordinary culture. How did that culture grow? People knew where their food came from. It's as simple as that. And the potato wasn't on that list in Tamil Nadu. You know, but other things were like the yam, the karnakenga, Hindi mesoran, you know, the elephant foot yam. And then you have things like that, Vettali uh, Valikalinga or the Chakkari Valikalinga, Maravali Kalinga. You have even the Panakalinga, the palm root, you know. We have huge amount of diversity in this culture. That's why we say, oh, Tamil Nadu, wow, amazing culture. It's because of that diversity, there was an incredible growth of culture. And if we go around the world, we'll see that beauty everywhere in Peru, in China, in Japan, in, you know, in different countries. You see these unique colors of humanity and they emerge because of man's relationship with the planet. And I think if we're going to talk about climate change, it's our relationship personally with the planet that we have to consider. So that means what do we eat and where does that food come from? And what's our relationship to that? It doesn't mean shouldn't people shouldn't be doctors and shouldn't be professors and engineers. Those are all equally valuable. Not everyone is to be farmer, but it's that cultural, how to say nutritional heritage, that sense of a cultural identity. I live in this bioregion. And therefore, I have a relationship with the land in this bioregion. And I know how to eat the varapu, the banana flower. And I know to eat the sundakai, the turkey berry. And I know to eat this ponangani kile and this other spinaches and weeds because that's part of my culture. So I would personally, you know, although I'm not an expert at all of climate change, but when I read about that and talk to friends who are in that subject, it, it strikes me that, you know, that the, uh, the responsibility lies with us as people, you know, and what we do as individuals, um, which is, of course, challenging, you know, it's also challenging for me. It's not like I'm sitting there having only eating ragi porridge, you know, but it's a it's a challenge to re-explore our cultural nutritional heritage within the bioregion that we live in and start to recognize that that's probably the more the biggest contributing factor uh, it is industrialized agriculture. So then the subject comes about, okay, well, how do you start to do this? Well, you know, if you're able to grow food, great, you start to do that. Otherwise, you have to start to, you know, dig into the culture, ask the older senior people, you know, well, because young people, they don't know anymore how to use, you know, these traditional foods. No, not every young person, but many young people. Why? Because our education system is pushing people to be successfully economically rather than being successfully in their relationship with the, with the nature. So it seems to be that that value has to be re-channeled into an education system and not just churn out people to get, you know, certificates and, you know, top job in USA. You know, that's pretty meaningless, pretty meaningless. If there's going to be no air to breathe and no, no water to drink and no food to eat, more importantly would be that we restructure our values as, as, as a society. And, uh, you know, that, that means to dig into something that's already there. In Tamil Nadu, it's there, this cultural knowledge is still there. It's being lost quite quickly. If you go to England, it's very much lost, this sense of, you know, cultural identity through understanding what grows around us. People don't know. Money has defined the cultural nutritional profile of a, of a society like in England or America. And with that, there's a lot of disease and, and a lot of fragmentation in the society. But in Tamil Nadu, there's something still there. People say, yeah, yeah. You know, that's that knowledge is still there. So it's to, I would say, the redemption of this planet 
you know, and I'm talking about climate change and all of those things. Redemption of humanity lies in a cultural redemption, a reclamation of a cultural knowledge. So that means knowing what grows locally. And if we were in Bihar, it would be what grows locally in Bihar. If we were in, you know, in Punjab, it would be exploring what grows locally in Punjab. And to recognize those foods and try and reintegrate those into our lives. That's on a very, very broad level. Of course, then there's all policy and all of that. That's not my department. I'm looking at the average person in the street. What can we do as individuals? So there's a lot more I could say, but I would say in a nutshell, this talk is only half an hour, no? Correct? Huh? 20 minutes. So there you go. I, in a nutshell, that's what, uh, what I have to say in, in Solitude Farm. We've demonstrated that not by going to college and PhD and then coming top down teaching that. It's come by working with local people and recognizing that when I go out into the garden and I see, oh, there's sundakai and green mango and there's korikira and all these things, those plants grow around me without effort, without chemicals. They grow without, without machinery. They grow, you know, without as I say, without effort, without a particular knowledge, you know, anyone knows how to get to plant a drumstick spinach, the Murunga Maram, no, you just break off the branch and plug it in, it starts growing. So if that food, according to UNESCO, and, and you know, all the great agencies of our world, if that food is considered to be the best food, nutritionally speaking, in the world, why don't we find it in restaurants in the, in the town, no? You know, people will be eating it at the house, in villages especially. But the more successful you are, the more C++ we are, you know, the more money we have, the less you will see those foods appearing on our plate. But there we will find, you know, the pasta that came from Italy and the pizza and all of this. So, again, the thing is to re-question what is success. What, are, what, are, what, is the, what is the values of our life? Because we have this life. And without it, we're finished, and it's going in that direction. So understand what grows easily, understand local foods, understand the cultural heritage of this, this great, you know, beautiful country. And uh, I think by understanding that, we can address such complex issues as climate change. Thank you very much. Can you start a little bit from my side until they would uh, raise their hands? I visited your phones uh, several times, of course, maybe uh, just share the stage now. But your form, I have seen quite rich in organic matter, you know. Uh, I'm sure others who had visited his form uh, might have seen with you know, such a lot of natural way of cultivating uh, several mixed cultures, right? And they use kind of built up the organic matter. So what in your opinion, uh, the microbial part in total productivity in your, at least in your garden or in general in organic? So my, uh, my, my teacher, I, I was, uh, as uh, told in the beginning, I was a student in J. Krishnamurti school. So when I was 18, I discovered uh, my guru, who is a Japanese farmer called Masanobu Fukuoka. So if you have a chance, you can read that book, The One Straw Revolution. And um, he was a, he was like a nyani, a Zen master, and he didn't talk much. You know, he was a, he was a, he was. A, I actually met him. That's how I know he didn't talk much, because <laughs> it was about 18, 19 years ago. I met him in Vandana Shiva's farm in Dehradun, and he was a short little guy with the indigo kimono, wooden chapels, and a big white beard. He looked like he looked the part as well. And um, one thing he did say to us, he said, "Only a fool." will understand uh, the relationship with nature. So that's that's a little challenging, especially in the university, you know, because <laughs> we spend so many years in studying and acquiring knowledge and such, you know. But he said, you know, I mean, you look at a character like Elon Musk, everyone looks up, amazing guy. He sent a, I think he sent a car to the sp outer space in a rocket ship or something. It's amazing. But when there's no water left, you know, when there's, when there's a crisis, or, of climate change, what use is that going to be? So all of our cerebral learning, which is really interesting, there is no doubt about it that nanotechnology, AI technology, uh, you know, all of that's fascinating. And also there will be some valuable usage of all of these things. But 
on an essential level where we are today, you know, he would he said, you know, the fool means that all opinions, ideas, ideologies, all been emptied, cup has been emptied. And he says that that perfection of nature, which I say is the Shakti of this country, you know, it's the very essence which is Bhumidev. In India, we call it Bhumidev. In Europe, they call it Gaya. In South America, they call it Pachimama. Every culture on this planet worship the earth. Nowadays, we only use the earth, you know, make use of her. All housing plot and the land is plowed and chemicals and, and this being more and more destroyed and thus we have climate change. The more we move away from nature and the reflection of that is knowing where our food comes from, the more we're going to get things like climate change. No? So what Fukuoka meant by being a fool and that word in Japanese is a bakka, that, that's a Japanese word for fool, he said stop trying to dominate nature. Stop trying to think we can understand nature because we can't. You can't take the soil and put it in a lab and say one plus one plus one plus one. You get to nine, you add one more. You don't have ten, you have nothing. Because understanding is not a linear, you know, Descartian sort of way of understanding this life. This life is a spider's web. Many years ago, we had a beautiful uh, couple stay in the farm and they, we worked with some kids on understanding ecology. And they played this game where they took cards and they wrote water body, another was spider, another was rat, another one was frog, another one was fox. And they put one card with another card with a piece of rope. And then these ropes were spread out like a spider web. So every kid would have a card. And what they showed is what happens if there's pollution and that frog dies. Frog will die, whole web collapse. Then they put it back. What happens if the water is polluted? You know, this card would collapse, everything would collapse. Everything is interlinked. Therefore, to understand just soil in isolation will not bring you the understanding of, of understanding this deeper relationship which we need to explore. That's why Fukuoka is saying be a bakka, be a, a fool. So natural farming, I feel the word in Tamil culture, Yirkei Vivisayam, is, a, is, a, is, is slightly misleading. It's not organic farming. Organic farming is still how I can make use of nature, how much money I can get, I'll be organic and have a stamp and all of this. But Yirkei Vivisayam, truly, the natural farming is a non-interventional farming. It's a farming that recognizes that nature is already perfect. And that if we leave her alone, if we stop intervening, stop plowing, stop adding chemicals, even prepared compost, stop disturbing the nature, the nature will offer us a lot of gifts. Now, I think that why the work we've done at Solitude has, has taken a, you know, quite a, um, how to say, it's, it's caught the public's eye, is that this work has happened in a very authentic and a very innocent way. Fukuoka's book is the one straw revolution. He was saying return all the rice straw back to the field to, to increase the soil fertility. So we've taken that somehow another step. We recognize that every leaf, every branch, every weed, every blade of grass is the first gift of mother nature. So by returning all of those to the field, which we constantly do, our soil is taking on a beautiful, you know, ecology, a beautiful dimension to it. And you start to see that that soil ecology is proportionate to the fertility, to the fertility is proportionate to the also the uh, porosity of the soil. So the more organic matter you, you return, the more diversity of nutrition is there. And the more life is in the soil, the more porosity, the less irrigation you need, the, the greater the water retention. And all of that is life, you know. The soil, fertility is the life in the soil. The life in the soil is all that decay and that, you know, that is the structure of the soil. So for all of that to happen, you don't have to be very clever. You just return organic matter. That's what, I mean, I haven't been to a college, I haven't, I passed my 12th and that was that. It's not being clever that will lead you to that. It's about having a, a sincere commitment to, to that type of work. And in Solitude Farm, what we've seen is, you know, it's not overnight, it's over the years. We've seen that uh, that Sundakai will grow on its own. You, you know Sundakai, no? Trilla. Hindi mein jangli It's a wild brinjal. 
It's a reverse diabetes plant. So if you if you can imagine that plant grows on its own. It's like a weed. It uses almost no water, just grows. You make very nice samba with it and a korumbu, of course, the vatil korumbu we have in Tamil Nadu. But also, you know, there's you can make chutneys with it. We use it all the time. Imagine government could get that food on a midday meal scheme. In one generation, diabetes would be finished. Farmers wouldn't have used chemicals. Farmers wouldn't have used tractors. In fact, it's not even too much about farming. It's about logistics, how to get that food that's growing without any effort onto our diet, you know. So I, I get approached by many colleges and different institutions, corporates, and I'm, I'm trying to re-landscape their, 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 their campuses with edible landscape. Now imagine here, just very practically, imagine here that Murungitkira is growing, and probably there's Murungitkira growing on this campus. Is, can someone confirm that? Murungitkira is here? A lot. A lot. Is it used in the canteen? No. There's the point. There's the point. It grows on the campus. Why? Because everyone knows it. And that Murungitkira is a superfood. You guys, at least you should know that from Facebook and all of this and the internet. You know, extremely nutritious. You are Tamilian? You know that Murungi Kira tastes, yes, yes, don't tell yes, yes, that. It's very popular in the household. Yeah, in the household. The but campus. why can't it be, if it's growing on a campus, and we're looking at climate change, why can't it be in the canteen? That's the point. Because and who will make that happen? Not the people in charge. It will be the students. Because you guys we're have to. in food miles. We want to make everything uh, fancy. Yeah, so that's the thing, you know. So this is the subject. We don't even need a one hour speech. Just a yeah. really simple thing, you know. Can you guys who have that food growing that tastes good, medicinal nutrition is super healthy, can we get that into the canteen here? And it's no this isn't the question of blame. This is every single person it's relevant. Every household we have to think about this. <laughs> Uh, again, a special thanks to Mr. Krishna Thank you so much um, for having me. Thank you, everybody. Here. And we uh, have just to wait uh, for two minutes. I think there is something from the organizers. Thank you, Mr. Krishna Mackenzie and Dr. Madhimar Natarajan. Now I'd like to invite Dr. Madhimar Natarajan to give a memento to the speaker. Thank you, sir.